Welcome to the next session of programming for problem solving. The topic of the day is recursion. Now, what is recursion? C provides its programmers with a facility where it is possible for the function to call itself. The concept by which a function calls itself is called recursion, and the function that performs this task is called recursive function. So you have already done what are functions. In every C program, one function is mandatory, which is called the main function. Other than the main function, you can create your own functions as well, which are called user defined functions. And you can call a function from within another function. But what is recursion? Recursion is a process when you place a call to the same function from within the body. So that means you are not calling function two from the body of function one. Instead, you are calling function one from within the body of function one. Special data structure called stack is used to implement recursion and it keeps all function calls on a stack. So we are going to use a last in first out data structure named stack to implement recursion. Because when a function calls itself, then we have to place the current call into the stack one by one so that when we start to return, we can pick up all those function call statements from the stack, process them and then eventually return back. Steps in recursion. So what are the different steps in recursion? A function calls itself for the first time. So when you call a function, we start with the execution of the function and from within the body of the function, we call the same function for the first time. So that is the first step in recursion. With each function call, the process moves one step closer to the base value and the function call parameters are saved in the stack. So what happens is because it is iterative in nature, there is a base value as to how many times you can call the same function again and again. So with every function call that you make, you move one step closer to that base value. For example, if you are to make recursive call to the same function five times, then after the first call, you move one value closer to that five from one to two and then to three, four and five. Once you reach five, which is the base value, we start to return. And with every function call statement, that is recursive function call statement, it is saved into the stack. The third step is when the process reaches the base value, it returns the value and all function call parameters saved in a stack are removed one by one. Processed and the final result is returned back to the original function call statement. The whole concept of what is recursion and what is the advantage of recursion that will be understood once we start with the examples. A recursion model. Recursion is a mathematical model and each problem must be described using a mathematical model before it can be solved. There are many problems in computer science which are by nature recursive. So all the loop statements such as finding the factorial of a given number, finding the sum of first n numbers, Fibonacci series, finding the product of first n numbers, all these are iterative problems and are recursive in nature. And hence they can be solved using the concept of recursion. Now, before we solve any recursion problem, 
it has to be mathematically represented now what is the mathematical representation of any recursive problem has been discussed in this slide and the problem taken into consideration is finding the factorial of some number now what do we mean by a factorial of any number for example what is the factorial of 5 factorial of 5 is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 so this is the factorial of 5 now what is the factorial of 4 now the factorial of 4 is equals to 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 so now we know what is the factorial of 5 and what is the factorial of 4 as you can see very clearly factorial of 5 also includes the factorial of 4 which is 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 and hence if we substitute the 4's factorial in the first equation then the factorial of 5 becomes 5 multiplied by 4 factorial as we come to the left hand side the description or explanation has been given here is the derivation factorial of n is equal to n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial as you can see on the right hand side 5 factorial is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 factorial so if you take 5 as n then n's factorial is equal to n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial only when the value of n is greater than 1. The factorial of n is equal to 1 if the value of n is equal to 1. So that means if the value of n is greater than 1, then we will use this. If the value of n is equal to 1, it means that the factorial of n is equal to 1. For example, Factorial of 3 is 3 factorial is equal to 3 multiplied by 2 factorial because it is n into n minus 1 factorial. What is the factorial of 2? Because we don't know the value of 2's factorial. Then what is the value of 2 factorial? The factorial value of 2 is 2 multiplied by 1 factorial. Now we don't know what is the value of 1's factorial. So 1 factorial is equals to 1. It is given in the mathematical model. When n is equals to 1, the factorial of n is equals to 1. Hence, the factorial of 1 is equal to 1. So replace this with the equation here. So 2's factorial becomes 2 into 1. So what is the value of 2 factorial? 2. So we will replace it here. So 3's factorial comes to be 3 multiplied by 2. So what is the final answer of 3's factorial? 6. So we have to represent each and every problem using this mathematical model and then we can derive the recursive function of the same. So let us start now. This is a recursive program for finding the factorial of a given number. So here in this program, we are using a function named factorial. The prototype of the same is the return type is integer. Name of the function is factorial and it will accept single argument, which will be of integer data type. So in the main function, we have declared two variables of the integer data type. And then we are accepting the input from the user in the variable num, that is num. So what will the num contain? It will contain the number for which we want to find the factorial. So the next statement is the function call statement and we are calling the function factorial. 
fact is equals to factorial of num as we place this function statement call we jump from this statement to the definition of factorial function so what is the definition of the factorial function the return type has not been mentioned if the return type is not given by default the return type of a function is integer so num will be passed into the argument x so x is the formal argument and num is the actual argument so we want to find the factorial of x now we need to suppose what the user entered let us suppose that the user entered 3 so we want to find the factorial of 3 now the first statement checks whether the value of x is equals to 1 which is not true because the value of x is equals to 3 so what will happen we will execute the else statement the else statement says return x into factorial of x minus 1 which is the mathematical model of factorial now we don't know what is the value of factorial of x minus 1 so we are going to recall the same function so this is this statement is why this function is called the recursive function because we are calling the same function from within the factorial function so that is why this is called the recursive function now because we are recursively calling this function we will save this into a stack so let us create one stack entry here and what we are going to do is that we are going to save the entry here what is the entry the value of x is 3 3 multiplied by factorial of 2 so this is the entry that has been saved inside the stack so when we call this function again the value of x is 2 if x is equals to 1 which is false then return x into factorial of x minus 1 so again a recursive call to the same function has been made and we are going to again save this entry inside a stack so what we will write here is 2 factorial is equal to return 2 into factorial of 1 so this is what we have saved now we have two entries in our stack so now we are going to find the factorial of 1 because x minus 1 that is 2 minus 1 is 1 so now we are going to find the factorial of 1 what is the factorial of 1 if x is equals to 1 which is true return 1 so we have found the factorial of 1 to be 1 so now we are going to pick up one entry from the stack the entry at the top of the stack is 2 into factorial of 1 so we are going to remove this entry from the stack so once we remove this entry from the stack we are going to evaluate that entry and the answer will come out to be 2 and now we are going to return that and again pick up the top entry from the stack the top entry from the stack is 3 into factorial of 2 we already know the value of factorial of 2 is 2 so remove this entry from the stack the final answer is 6 now this answer will be returned to the function call statement which is this one so what will be the final value of the variable fact the final value of the variable fact will be 6 now in the next line we are going to display the answer that is factorial of num is fact so the final answer will be factorial of 3 is equals to 6 similarly we can find the factorial of 4 5 and 6 this is the solution to the problem of factorial using recursion why it is recursion i'll just explain it once again why we call this as a recurs recursion or a recursive function because here is the definition of the function factorial and within the definition of the function factorial 
we contain a function call to the same function. We also have another function call statement to the factorial function, but this statement actually is written inside the main function. So hence, hence this is not recursion. Calling some other function is not recursion. But when we call the same function from within the body of that function, then it is called recursion. I hope you were able to understand what is factorial and how we can find the solution to the problem of factorial using recursion. So next we will see a few more examples of how we can use recursion to solve uh, some other problems. So the next problem that we are going to see is called the recursive program for Fibonacci series. I hope you know what is Fibonacci series. Still, I will uh, give you a small little example for you to have better understanding of what is Fibonacci series. Let us suppose that if the user gives the input six and we want to find the Fibonacci series of the same, the Fibonacci series actually starts with zero and one. So these are the first two entries that we will have in the Fibonacci series. And the next element in the series is always the sum of the last two current elements. So what are the last two current element of the series? The last two elements of the series are zero and one. So zero plus one becomes one. So what will be the next element in the series? That will be the sum of the last two elements currently that we have in the list. That is one and one. So the next element will be two. And again, what will be the next element? That is the sum of the last two elements. That is two plus one is equals to three. What will be the last element in this list? The last element in this list will be 3 plus 2, that is 5. We can go further if we want to have a larger input. Then the last two elements are 5 and 3, so hence 8. The last two elements are 8 and 5, hence 13. And you can continue. So what is Fibonacci series? Fibonacci series is a series in which the value of the element is decided by the sum of the previous two elements. So how you represent it mathematically? If you want to find the Fibonacci of any number n, it is equal to the Fibonacci of n minus 2 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 1. It is the sum of the last two elements. And what is the value of the last two elements? that can also be calculated with the help of the same function. So the mathematical model of the Fibonacci series is Fibonacci of n is equals to Fibonacci of n minus 2 plus Fibonacci of n minus 1 only when, only when the value of n is greater than 1. And what if the value of n is equal to 1? when the value of n is equal to 1, the Fibonacci of n is also 1. And what if the value of n is 0, then the Fibonacci of it is also 0. So that means if you want to find the Fibonacci of 0, it is 0. If you want to find the Fibonacci of 1, it is 1. And if you want to find out the Fibonacci of any value which is greater than 1, then it is Fibonacci of n minus 2 plus Fibonacci of n minus 1. So I hope the mathematical model is clear to you. Now we will have a look at the program. The program is very simple because you just want to substitute this uh, mathematical model into the program. So here in the main function, we have declared three variables. And now we want to take the input of the number for which the series has to be generated. And let that number be num. As I have already told you that 0 and 1 are the first two numbers, automatic numbers in the series. So we have printed 0 and 1 right here. Now 
we want to find the fibonacci so we call the function fibonacci is equals to fibonacci of the num so we want to find the fibonacci of num so let's just go to the fibonacci function the definition of the fibonacci function is given here so this is the definition of the fibonacci function it is very simple just have a look at your mathematical model it says if fibonacci of n is equals to 1 if n is equals to 1 which means if x is equals to 1 simply return 1 what is the fibonacci of 0 it is 0 if else if the value of x is equals to 0 then return 0 as simple as that if the value of x is 1 return 1 if x is 0 then return 0 else what we are supposed to return we are supposed to return fibonacci of n minus 1 plus n minus 2 so here you can see return fibonacci of x minus 2 plus fibonacci of x minus 1 that is the end of it so once we understand what is the mathematical model of any problem then it is easy for us to write the recursive program for the same in the last two examples what we have seen is that we were able to compute the mathematical model and then simply we put that mathematical model into the recursive calls so i hope you are able to understand how we are able to find the solution to the problem of recursion and fibonacci series using recursive calls so we will see a few more problems that are related to the problem so a solution using recursion one is called is ackerman function now what is an ackerman function in computable theory the ackerman function named after william ackerman is one of the simplest and earliest discovered examples of total computable function that is non not preemptive primitive recursive so we will not go into the detail of what it actually means but here at the bottom we are given the mathematical model of the ackerman function so let's have a look at what is the mathematical model so we are going to pass two parameters to the ackerman function and those two parameters are m comma n now what if the value of m is equals to zero which means if m is equal to zero that means the first parameter is zero we are going to return n plus 1 as simple as that if the values of m is greater than 0 but the value of n is 0 then we are going to place a recursive call to the same function and we are going to pass a of m minus 1 comma 1 and the last is if both m and n are greater than 0 then we are going to again place a recursive call to the same function and what we are going to pass is a of m minus 1 and in the bracket another call to a which is m of n minus 1. So once this mathematical model has been defined you will see if we try to find the solution to this problem then the function will contain these three conditions. What are those three conditions? If m is equals to 0, if m is greater than 0 and n is equals to 0, else if m is greater than 0 and n is also greater than 0. Now let's have a look into the program for the same. As I already stated, that the recursive function will deal with these three conditions that have been defined in the mathematical model. Now here you can see. In the main function initially we have taken the input for the two numbers that is m and n what is the value of m and n so here you can see then the call to the function a a stands for the ackerman so we have just used the short form for that m comma n and here is the definition of the ackerman function like i said that the total solution depends upon three conditions the first condition is if the value of m is equal to zero remember what it was it was return n minus one so that is it as simple as that if m is not equal to zero it naturally means that m is greater than 
1 because we are working on non negative numbers so if m is not equal to 0 then m is greater than 0 now we need to check the value of n either the value of n is 0 or n is greater than 0 if the value of n is equals to 0 then again place a recursive call to the function using these two parameters and if the value of n is greater than 0 in the last condition then a double call is placed a of m minus 1 comma a of m comma n minus 1 so there is no need for you to get into the detail of it but just that you need to understand what is the mathematical model for the Ackerman function and how we can write the recursive function for the same and once the mathematical model has been defined you are simply supposed to substitute that into the recursive function call statement so this was our solution to the third problem so so far what we have done is factorial fibonacci and ackermann function the next is quick sort now what is a quick sort a quick sort is one of the fast algorithms for sorting a list of elements sorting basically means arranging of the elements in some order ascending or descending ascending means a series which is in non decreasing order and descending means a series which is in non increasing order so if you are given a list of uh, eight elements as you can see in this example a total of uh, eight elements have been given right here the quick sort starts by placing the last element in the list or the first element in the list at its correct position so what we are going to do we are going to try and place 35 at its correct position which is the first element in the list so how we are going to uh, basically start so basically we are going to start with is the first step is start looking from the right towards the left the first element is called the lower and the last element is called the upper so we are going to start from upper and move towards the left and find an element which is smaller than 35 now 90 is greater than 35 67 is also greater than 35 but 32 is smaller than 35 so what we are going to do we are going to interchange these two numbers as you can see in the next figure 32 and 35 have been interchanged now 35 is the value of the upper index and 32 is the value of the lower index now we are going to start from the lower index that is 32 and move towards the right hand side and find an element which is greater than 35 this time we are going to find an element which is greater than 35 and we find that the first element itself is greater than 35 so we are going to replace these two numbers 35 will come here and 45 will go here and we are going to repeat the step process again so that means start from 45 start moving toward the left hand side and find an element which is smaller than 35 so what we get is that 6 is smaller than 35 so just interchange these two numbers 6 comes here and 35 comes here now start from 6 start moving towards the right hand side and find an element which is greater than 35 so 61 is greater than 35 and hence replace it so here we come to the end of it so if you look at this uh, final list very carefully 35 actually reaches at its correct position what is the correct position of 35 all the elements on the left hand side of 35 as you can see here are smaller than 35 and all the elements on the right hand side of 35 as you can see in this rectangle they all are greater than 35 that means 35 has reached at its correct position so how will the quick sort proceed from here because 35 has reached at its correct position now we are left with two lists one is on the left hand side which includes two elements 32 and 6 and one on the right hand side which includes five elements now these two lists will be passed to perform the quick sort so what is quick sort pick up the first element in the list place it to its correct position 
and then send the left and the right list for sorting again apply the quick sort or the partitioning on those and send the left and right continue till all the elements are sorted and placed at its correct position so now what we will look into is we will look at the recursive function for the same so here in this recursive function the process of partitioning has not been explained written or the function has not been given only the function of the quick sort has been given so if you look at this recursive function very carefully what we are given is we are given the array for which the quick sort has to be applied and the index of the first and the last element now if the value of low is less than high which means that there is more than one element in the list then we will perform the partitioning the process of partitioning has already been explained to you in the last slide how the partitioning happens pick up the first element in the list and then place that element at its correct position so when we place an element at its correct position that means the first element at its correct position that position will be returned as pi now we are going to again call the quick sort algorithm as i told you for the list on the left hand side and the list on the right hand side so what is the value of the two parameters for the list on the left hand side of pi that will start from low up to pi minus 1 i'll just give you an example uh, right here if we have a list let us suppose that the starting index is 0 the first element in the list has been correctly positioned at position number 4 and the last index of the list was 12 so initially we passed a list that started from 0 up to 12 the first element has been correctly placed at position number 4 now what are the index values of the elements at the left hand side so at the left hand side we have a list starting from 0 up to 4 minus 1 so we have a list starting from 0 up to 4 minus 1 and what is the index of the list on the right hand side that is 4 plus 1 up to 12 that means on the left hand side we have is low comma pi minus 1 and on the right hand side what we have is pi plus 1 comma high so that is the end of it this is simply the quick sort recursive quick sort algorithm it does not include the procedure for how the partitioning is done but the partitioning process has been explained in the last slide what we are going to do initially we are going to check if we have a list which is greater than one element if there is only one element in the list or then there is no need to sort the list so how we will know that there are more than one element in the list is through this if the value of low is less than high that means you have more than one element in the list if you have more than one element in the list then simply call the partitioning algorithm and place the first element at its correct position the correct position of the first element will be saved at pi and then we will again call the quick sort algorithm for the elements on the left hand side of pi and a quick sort algorithm for the list of elements on the right hand side so i hope the concept of much uh, quick sort is clear to you the next and the last example that we are going to see is the much sort now in merge sort it is based upon the principle that a merge sort can be applied to two sorted lists so merge sort can only be applied if the two lists are sorted now is there any condition on the value of n for which the list is always sorted just imagine that if you have a list with single element if you have a list with single element 
if you have a single element obviously that is sorted there is no need to perform the sorting if you have more than one element in the list then yes you need to apply the sorting so how the merge sort actually works if you are given an initial list as you can see here you are given an initial list of six elements we are going to break this into six lists of single element each so what you have initially is one list with six elements we are going to break it into six lists of one element each so what we have done in the first step is that we have broken this list into two lists of three elements each then further these lists have been divided into two lists each now because uh, 6 and 10 they both are single elements they cannot be further broken so this list 5 12 has been broken into 5 and 12 and 9 and 1 is further broken into 9 and 1 so what we have initially what was given to us if you look at this uh, very carefully initially we were given a list of six elements single list of six elements we broken in into six lists of one element each now because in every list there is a single element which means that all these six lists are sorted now we are going to apply the merge sort so what we have done so far is division this is not the part of the merge sort now the merge sort will be applied on these six lists so how it is applied we will apply the merge sort initially on these two lists to begin with 5 and 12 so 5 is the smallest element it is inserted first and then 12 is the element which is left in the two lists so it is inserted next now we are going to merge these two lists one is smaller element we place it here and 9 is the only element left so we will place it here so what we get is two sorted lists 5 12 and 1 9 these two lists are already sorted because they consist of single element each so now what we are going to do we are going to merge sort these two lists 5 is the smallest element so we will place it first then 6th is the smallest element we will place it second and 12 is the only element left so we are going to place so we get a sorted list of three elements similarly we are going to merge the two lists and what we are going to get is one nine and ten the last step of the merge sort is we are going to apply it right here the smallest element is one then five then six then nine and then ten only element left is 12. so what we get is the final sorted list from the unsorted list so what is the process of the merge sort first of all given a single list we will break that into multiple lists of single element each and then apply the merge sort and combine those lists one by one to reach a single list again please remember that the merge sort cannot be applied on the lists which are unsorted uh, which are unsorted so merge sort is always applied on two lists which are sorted so how to uh, get to a situation where the lists are sorted break the uh, unsorted list into a sorted list of single element each like we have done so this overall process is divided into two parts this total process is known as partitioning or division and the second part actually contains the merge sort so i hope uh, this is clear to you and now we will move towards our uh, recursive function for the merge sort so this is the merge sort function as you can see right here the merge sort has three parameters the first parameter is the array on which the sorting has to be applied and then p and r are the indexes of the two numbers so if p is greater than r 
if p is greater than r you can simply return q is equal to you can simply return actually p is greater than r then you are going to return otherwise you are going to compute the middle of p plus r divided by 2 p greater than r means that there is no need to uh, perform the merge sort otherwise if you have a list with more than uh, one element then you need to perform the merge sort then you are to supposed to compute the middle of it that means q is equals to p plus r divided by 2 please remember q represents the middle of p and r and how can we compute the middle of p and r we can compute the middle of p and r by p plus r divided by 2 now what we are supposed to do we are supposed to uh, send these two lists one from the p to the middle and one from the middle to the r i'll explain it to you we saw this example even when we were working on the quick sort but we will see this example once again if you have a list for example uh, with an index sub list starting from 11 to let's say 20 Or twenty one. What is the middle of it? Eleven plus twenty one that becomes thirty two. Thirty two divided by two is equals to sixteen. So that's it. So what is eleven? What is sixteen? And what is twenty one? Eleven is p, and twenty one is r. So what is q? Which is the middle? Is p plus r divided by two? So this becomes q so now we have a list on the left hand side and we have a list on the right hand side what is the size of the list on the left hand side that is p comma q as you can see here the first list on which the merge sort is to be applied is from p to q and what is the list on the right hand side that is q plus 1 starting from q plus 1 up to and then simply merge these two lists that means a p q and r so what we are going to do initially we are going to divide perform the division division means divide the list into multiple lists of single element each that can be achieved by the highlighted rectangle so this particular code is used to divide the list into smaller lists and then we are going to apply the merging so the merge will be applied to all the lists which are of one element greater so i hope you were able to understand what is merge sort uh, functions it may take some time for you to understand the recursive function but i hope that you begin by uh, solving a few more examples how we can apply the factorial how we can apply the fibonacci how we can solve the ackermann and how we can solve the quick sort and merge sort once the examples are clear then writing the recursive functions will also become easy so thank you very much